welcome back to The Road to Nightfall. Now that we have finished with the origins of the new Robin, it is time to, re to get to one of the other major plot elements of this arc with the introduction of Venom. Not the black inky symbiote from Marvel Comics, but the super steroid. This storyline, um, titled simply Batman Venom, ran in Legends of the Dark Knight from issue 16 to 20, and was written by Denny O'Neill, with layouts by Trevor Von Eden, wrote pencils by Russell Braun, inks by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, letters by Willie Schabert, colors by Neil Orff, and was edited by Kevin Dooley and Andy Helfer. We open at an unspecified time, early in Batman's career, the child, Sissy Porter, who is kidnapped and held bound in Gotham's sewers. Batman finds her, but not before a collapse cuts him off from where she's being held, and being just a man, he doesn't have the strength to clear the rubble before she drowns. Brief quick aside here, I really like how this portion pans out, plays out with Trevor Von Eden's layouts. They do a really solid job of building tension through this sequence here, um, and also playing up the sense of claustrophobia. After this failure, Batman returns home, upset. All his skills, all his training, has led him to where this girl was held, but did not grant him the strength to save her. However, there is one more job to do before the night is over. Batman heads to Sissy's father to give her the news. Dr. Porter, her father, does not react how you expect. And circumstances may have put Batman off his guard, but he doesn't catch it either. It's... Porter's response is like how you'd expect Gendo Wakari to react to news of Shinji getting hit by truck-kun. It's not grief or any normal sense of mourning, but almost a laid-back, blasé attitude. An oh well. Porter says that when asked, the kidnapper didn't want to be paid in cash, but paid in drugs, in particular a super steroid that Porter was working on. And Porter brings up that if Batman had had them... Sissy wouldn't have died. Odd for Porter to bring this up, considering um, his response earlier, but again, Batman doesn't pick up on this. Just then, the kidnappers show up, one coming in guns blazing. Batman takes him out quickly and then leaps onto the kidnapper's truck. He tries to hold on, but just can't keep his grip and slides off. In the Batcave, Bruce tries to lift a barbell that weighs about as much as that last concrete block did, and not only fails, he tears his deltoid in the process. Bruce looks into the truck, which was apparently recently painted, with some help of the current of the DA. Harvey Dent, which gives us something of a timeline for when this story takes place. Alfred suggests that Bruce take some time to recover, because a, a deltoid tear is nothing to sneeze at. But Bruce refuses. He's taken the kidnappers on tonight. The attempt goes poorly, with Batman barely escaping with his life. The kidnappers want to chase after Batman, but their employer says that they wait. In a delirious state, badly injured, Bruce imagines first being taunted by Superman, then Sissy, then Alfred, and then Bruce wakes up. Bruce puts the suit back on, but not to go after the kidnappers again. Instead, he goes to Dr. Porter's house and accepts the pills, taking one. Returning to the Batcave, he easily lifts the barbell and then goes and just as easily pummels the kidnappers. And then he laughs. And it's terrifying. Issue 17 opens with a man in, in a trench coat and fedora busting into a bunch of crooks' safe house and beating the crap out of them, forcing them to spill their guts with narration that would very easily fit Frank Miller's pen. Not, not contemporary Frank Miller. Actually, we know this is the 90s, so this is Sin City. So yes, contemporary Frank Miller's pen. Uh, we cut to the Batcave and learn that the trench coated figure was in fact Bruce. He's been cutting back on the like forensics detective work and not wearing the bat suit much at all. Alfred does not approve, particularly since Bruce is still using the as-yet-unnamed steroid without further investigation of its effects, leading to an argument ending with either Alfred quitting or being fired, depending on how you go with this, whether Alfred quits first or Batman fires him first. At Dr. Porter's house, and he now has a first name, Randolph, Batman is introduced to retired Army General G um, Timothy Slaycroft. Batman asks for his pills, but only gets four. Batman mentions the kidnappers are out of prison again and asks if he should take them out. Porter says to leave them for now. After Batman leaves, Slaycroft and Porter talk about nearly having Batman under their control, 
and Porter asks Slaycroft to deal with the kidnappers, Patsy and Brew, who are also Porter's distributors, but now with Slaycroft's relationship with Porter, Patsy and Brew have outlived their usefulness. While leaving the property, Batman ambushes General Slaycroft's son, Timothy Slaycroft Jr. Jr. is a big kid, taller than Batman and very strongly built. Before returning to the Batcave, Batman decides to pay Patsy and Brew a visit, only to arrive right after they've been killed by Slaycroft's men, if not Slaycroft himself. Batman hears the getaway car, and as the steroid is still in effect, he throws a refrigerator through the wall to stop the car. Batman discovers that, in fact, this isn't Slaycroft himself. The assassins are in Slaycroft's em employ, but before Batman can learn this from them, they are killed themselves by another gunman, and Batman is warned away from the attack. This shakes Batman up, and he goes to Commissioner Gordon for the ballistics report, and unusually asks about Gordon's family, something Gordon doesn't want to talk about because they're not on that close a term yet. Since the port isn't ready yet, Batman leaves, feeling very numb. The next day, Slaycraft and Porter discuss the previous night's work, and Slaycraft is concerned about Gordon. Gordon can't be bought. In the Batcave, Bruce is alone, no Alfred to confide in or provide advice. So with no one but the Bats, Bruce thinks through the problem out loud. The person who warned him sounded a lot like General Slaycraft's son. However, Batman's line of thought is derailed by the revelation that he's out of pills. Batman returns to Porter, demanding his fix. Now, Batman will get his pills once he's earned them. All he needs to do is to kill Commissioner Gordon. Dun dun dun! At the start of the next issue, Batman is surprised by his agreement. Uh, he does something that is in character for him, and he recognizes it. And that said, honestly, he doesn't even try. Instead, in a very clumsy, awkward way, Batman warns Gordon about Porter and Slaycroft and lets him know to go after them if Batman fails to bring them down, showing his own lack of confidence that he's very reliant on the drugs and he's not confident in his ability to act, not just act without their influence, but what he would do if offered them. And indeed, Batman tries to take the two down and fails. Not because of a sneak attack or because he's overpowered, he fails because he's distracted by the drugs. Quick aside, through all of this, Braun and Eden do a really great job of using their layouts and the art to get across Batman's struggle to keep control for all of this. And it comes to a head in the next sec uh, in what happens next, with Batman calling Alfred, realizing what the drugs are doing to him, and tells Alfred to lock him into the Batcave and not let him out for a month. Batman feels and is drawn like a totally broken person here. Um... He is not, knows that he's not the person he used to be, and he is lacking... His pursuit of physical strength has damaged his inner strength, and he recognizes that he needs to rebuild that. And meanwhile, General Slaycroft and his son, and also Porter, are on a plane to the island of Santa Prisca, after cleaning their home of any clues to their plan. They continue their experiments with a new test subject, Slaycroft's son Jr., starting with an updated version of the steroid. Over the course of the month, Junior falls for a local girl, Consuela, but the steroids make him more pliable, aggressive, and reduce his overall intelligence. He starts out being more generally sort of sympathetic and introspective and philosophical, talking about poetry with the girl, but that slowly kind of fades from his mind. Also during all of this, the general slits casually lets slip to the reader his own racist and homophobic views along with the implication that he's had his wife murdered, as if we didn't already hate him for being a fascist with what his plans are for the steroid and Batman, as mentioned earlier, and also for considering his son expendable. Meanwhile, in Gotham, over the course of the same month, Alfred has been monitoring the Batcave, making sure that Bruce is still alive, but not opening the cave, no matter how much Alfred wants to. He wants to. Finally, at the end of the month, all is complete. In Santa Prisca, Dr. Porter has completed a series of dermal implants on Junior to make him bulletproof, and the drugs have made him violent and pliable enough that his father is able to order him to murder Consuela without any hesitation. And in Gotham, Batman is now clean of the drugs and is ready to go after Slaycroft. Issue 19 opens on Santa Prisca, as General Slaycroft and Dr. Porter now have a squad of super soldiers, and they're taken on their first field test to massacre a village. 
a village that some of these people were taken from, and indeed one of them kills his own grandmother. Further, with hypnosis drugs, they'll follow any order, even stand at attention for days until they starve to death or dehydrate. With these men, Slaycroft intends to overthrow the U.S. government and institute a fascist state. No discussion of whether he's considered how he's going to handle, you know, The Flash, Superman, Wonder Woman, any of these other superheroes. Meanwhile, Bruce Wayne and, ben and Alfred have bought a plane and fly it over Santa Prisca to scout at the General's compound, only for the General to shoot them down with a solar, solar fire surface-to-air missile. Batman and Alfred bail out, but end up on different ends of the island. One more quick aside, Braun gives Bruce a really great oh-crap face for this section. At the compound, Slaycroft sends his men to keep watch for Batman. However, Porter, while implying that he invented crack cocaine and provided the information on how to make it to a local drunk kingpin who basically runs Santa Prisca, um, mentions that said kingpin has repaid the favor by delivering Alfred. Slaycroft and Porter trust up Alfred and stake him out to lure sharks, and also Batman, and Batman goes out to rescue him. He succeeds doing so, killing a shark and nearly killing two locals in the boat in the process, before coming to shore, punching out Porter, and then running into the walking cement truck that is Junior. With issue 20, the last issue, we start with Batman trying to get through to Junior, and we get some confirmation of what I suspected earlier. General Slaycroft murdered his wife because he felt she was turning Junior into a weakling. Junior, who is, well, under the control of his father, literally, overpowers Batman and is only saved from death by Porter, who wants to use him for an experiment. Batman is locked in a room without his utility belt, where the only way out, way out is through a 800-pound door. To open it, he has to pull down on a chain hanging from the ceiling to pull up the door. Further, the room is slowly going to fill with water. Batman will be provided with a new, enhanced, more addictive venom to help him escape before the room fills with water. Batman manages to persuade them to get a couple additional things, like a bed and a table, both which Porter is confident Batman can't use to escape. In his cell, Batman resists the temptation for the pills and continues putting together his plan for his escape, carefully loosening several stone blocks from the walls in the process. Meanwhile, during the confusion on the beach, Alfred slips, slipped away and has reached the north end of the island and rowed out to sea, where he was picked up by a ship which let him use the radio, in turn allowing him to contact Commissioner Gordon. Unfortunately, while Santa Prisca as a country is still literally run by narco-traffickers, it's also one that Gordon can't send troops to because he's a police commissioner and it's still a sovereign nation. Outside of the uh, of where Batman is being held, General Slaycroft asks Porter about his notes, and Porter responds, oh, they're all in his head. So Slaycroft decides it's time to get his own copy of the notes and end this relationship by torturing Porter until he tells him how to make the drug himself. In his prison, with some ingenuity and grit, Batman manages to MacGyver his way out of the cell and gets past the guards before returning to the Slaycraft compound. Porter had finished spilling the formula with Slaycraft being about to leave to test the information. If it was correct, Porter would get a swift death. But if it's wrong... And at that, Batman busts in. He overpowers the general before he can give orders to his goons, but just after he's able to give the order to tell them to accept, expect orders and freeze Porter. And at that, Porter uses the tape recorder that the General had been using to record Porter's um, testimony, for lack of a better term, to use it to force Junior to kill his father. And with Junior's augmented strength, Batman can do nothing to stop him. At that, Porter, take, Porter is taken by Batman on a helicopter to the mainland. On the course of this trip, Porter lets slip that he'd taken a significant dose of venom and... Batman's fine with that, particularly considering it's the, again, super addictive Venom. Later, Gordon informs Batman that the withdrawal symptoms were so great that Porter died in custody. And Batman looks out at the city, thinking about what could, about the fates of Timmy, as far as Junior, and the other people who were subjected to General Slaycroft's and Porter's experimentation, and of course, Sissy as well. This was a good storyline. It's actually my first 
actually not my first time reading it. I read it once just in a solo trade back in the day when I was in high school checking out from the library. Um, but my first time really revisiting it in the in the context of the buildup for Nightfall. The storyline does slip kind of into very special episode territory at a few points. And I will admit that if Nightfall had not happened, I don't think this story would have stood out from the contemporary stories in Legend of the Dark Knight the same way. I've read a few other little brief storylines that are kind of before and after this, along with some of the storylines going directly before the start of Nightfall. And it's a solid book. It's a really solid book. And it's part of the reason it's so solid is because it's a lot of standalone stories. And if this would have been just another one, it would have been considered a part of a really good run. Denny O'Neill is one of the best Batman writers kind of of all time. Along with, honestly, some of the other writers of this era. Honestly, this is a good, solid year for Batman. But what makes this stand out to a significant extent, is its tie-in to Nightfall. It's, oh, this is where Venom came from, and that's going to play out well with, and in a big way, with Bane. But, as it is, if Nightfall didn't exist, it'd be a good story. It wouldn't be a must-read. Because of Nightfall, it kind of elevates this to, this is a story that is much more worth your time because it's an introduction of a great concept, or a significant concept that is told in a good way. Uh, now, next time, we take our final step on the road to the Nightfall Saga with the introduction, Azrael. And then after that, Nightfall will begin in earnest. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.